Welcome everybody. Um, it is 910. Um, my name is Carrie Smaker and I'm the principal tech facilitator from Tustin, one of two from Tustin Unified. And it is my pleasure and honor to um, introduce our presenter today. Karen Knudsen is my friend and my colleague in Tustin. She is the coordinator for elementary programs for TUSD. And today she's going to be presenting on depth and complexity for all, teaching thinking. Um, how it's gonna work today, she's gonna go through the presentation and if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I will be manning the chat. If I can't answer them, um, we will have a Q and A session at the end of this meeting or presentation. And I will be sharing her slides with you in the end, um, at the end as well. So without further ado, Karen, it's all you. Thanks, Carrie. First, happy National Strawberry Day. I don't know if you guys knew that today is National Strawberry Day. And fun fact, one acre of land can grow about 50,000 pounds of strawberries. So let's make sure our chat is working. I'm gonna ask you a question. How many seeds does an average strawberry have? So in the chat box, and there's no prizes, so don't overthink it. Just whatever you think is, um, what, how many seeds? Let's see. All right, the chat box is working. Ooh. I think some of you already knew this answer. All right, and drum roll, the correct answer is the average strawberry has about 200 seeds. So if you had time, you could extend this activity with your students. So what are you wondering? What is your favorite way to eat strawberries? Would you rather, would you rather eat a strawberry pie or would you rather eat a chocolate dipped strawberry? Um, today is also, um, oops, I just went on the wrong thing, hold on. Today is also National Polar Bear Day. So if you um, love polar bears, today is your day. And it's also, a uh, no SMEA awareness day, which fun fact, I actually have a good friend that has this. This is a condition where you lose your sense of smell. It's national Kahlua day and national retro day. So um, this is a fun way to start your day with your students. National day calendar is a resource that has um, every, every day has, you know, a different thing. And it's surprising when you go on there because like today has five different things. And then you can also apply to have a day become a national something day, which is kind of fun for your students. They look forward to this. So thumbs up if anybody has ever used this with your students. Has anyone tried this out with their students? So I know my own children, they like to ask Siri what national day it is in the morning before we go to school. So it's kind of a fun thing um, for your students too. So our agenda today is um, why, why even you know, dive into this work? Um, we're going to go through the depth and complexity thinking prompts, cultivating divergent thinking, what does that even mean, and then um, I'll share some resources and then um, we'll do a Q&A at the end. So we're going to start with the why. So I've been, um, ha I've had this major mind shift over the last few years. So I've been teaching almost 20 years. In my first decade, I was a resource specialist trying to differentiate and get kids engaged in their learning using a textbook. So for those of you who have been around a while, you know um, the plight of that. And it was not really going well. And then 10 years ago, Coatsen came into my life and the clouds parted and practices shift and the one size fits all, um, the one size fits all became more individualized with workshops. So as you guys know, workshop, readers, writers workshop, CGI, math workshop, um, definitely has changed practices to make um, makes it more accessible to our students. And GSS came and science standards became, um, you know, more integrated and more inquiry based. Growth mindset became a thing. Making mistakes are good became a thing. SEL practices in the classroom is more common. All great stuff. But the achievement gap is not closing for many of our students and especially some of our students in our in our categorical groups like our low wealth students or our students of color or students in a disability with a disability. 
And the thing is, teachers, you guys are crushing it. I think that best first instruction is, is probably the best it's ever been, in my humble opinion. So how do we get all of our students to retain information and do the higher order thinking tasks that we know that they're capable of doing? So um, Carrie mentioned that I'm a coordinator currently, but before this role, I've been a differentiation TOSA and a math TOSA and a gate TOSA. And this is my sixth year coordinating our gate program in our district. And before taking on the gate gig, I had lots of experience with differentiation, um, but not a lot of experience directly with gate. And so um, to prepare myself for the role, I dove in. So I went to UCI and got certified in their gate certification program. I read lots of books, articles, went to conferences. I consumed all things to really try to learn what, oops, what um, the gate program is and how to support gifted students. And I learned that giftedness is a thing and that kids with that label, with the gate label do learn differently. Um, and they're usually identified because of their strong divergent thinking skills. And this strength of theirs that they usually kind of develop and have um, more innately helps students tackle higher order thinking skills. So they, um, with this, this strong divergence thinking, they're able to analyze, evaluate, and, and create. Um, and they, they kind of seek out those opportunities. And gifted kids also have traits that make school and life sometimes challenging. So they sometimes need um, support in peer relationships. They need support with executive function, um, self-management or awareness, managing stress or anxiety. So I learned a lot about that side. And I also learned a lot of strategies to help students um, have that higher order thinking. And that's what a GATE program, if you've been certified in GATE, then you're, you're probably familiar with that. If you haven't, that's a great opportunity um, to be able to learn a lot of strategies that can help support higher order thinking skills. So I used to say that, that the gate strategies that we use for our gate students, um, that the, the gate kids need these strategies. But I recently amended this statement to all students need these strategies. So today, I wanted to share a couple of those strategies with you. All right. Another reason, sorry, I'm scrolling too quickly. Um, another reason that I'm sharing today is because in January, I, um, I went to a webinar um, that Chris Wilson from the UCLA Lab School presented on, and he presented on the art of cross-curricular um, integration. And he shared his resources, and, and his resources were full of depth and complexity prompts and universal themes and a lot of the the framework that is that is typically referred to as the gate framework um, and he was using this framework to integrate curriculum and it was it was beautiful and I got so excited because I've never really seen gate strategies on in a coats and you know um, conference or kind of presented alongside of the work that we're doing and so kind of in a moment of weakness, I volunteered to share this information with you guys today. Um, I'm just kidding. I actually, you know, it's such a great opportunity to be able to, um, it's an honor to be able to share this information and to feel like um, I actually have something that, I, that I'm qualified somewhat to share with you. So, um, okay, so we're gonna get into it. Chris also shared um, some of the books and resources that have been impacting his work. So I wanted to share some of the, the resources that have been impacting my work, you know, lately, the the book that probably um, I can't stop talking about and is visiting in my dreams is um, "Culture Responsive Teaching in the Brain," and Zaretta Hammond um, is is basically my touchstone for today, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about her work as I go through um, what I'm presenting today. And then um, the gifted guide to depth and complexity, we've never really had a good um, handbook or book on the framework and this was published last year. So we finally have um, a good resource. You Before you probably would have to go to a conference or, or get some articles to get more information, but now there's a book. Um, Cognitive Engagement Strategies um, by Rebecca Stavra is really good. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. And then um, universal design for learning, um, that was the key for me that basically changed my idea 
on why I was struggling with differentiation um, and switching it to UDL. So the difference, if you're not familiar, is UDL is really starting from the from the beginning, and it's about access and um, and making sure that all students. Um, you're proactively planning for all students from the beginning. And then The Curious Classroom by Harvey Smokey Daniels, if you're familiar with his work. And then of course, um, Joel, Joel Bowler's work, Mathematical Mindset. All right, so as I mentioned, um, this book, Culture Responsive Teaching in the Brain has had a huge impact on me. So I'm gonna start with some quotes from Zaretta Hammond. And I hope this doesn't bug you when presenters read slides, but I apologize in advance. Um, but she is going to say it much better um, than, I, than I would be able to say it. So here we go. So building brain powers is the missing link to closing the achievement gap for underperforming culturally and linguistically diverse students. Okay, I'm gonna read that again because it's Saturday morning and some of us may not have had our second cup of coffee yet. So building brain powers is the missing link to closing the achievement gap for underperforming culturally and linguistically diverse students. She goes on, classroom studies document the fact that underserved English learners, poor students and students of color routinely receive less instruction in higher order thinking skill development than other students. Their curriculum is less challenging and more repetitive. So students of color recently received less instruction in higher order thinking skills development, less challenging and more repetitive. So if you're thinking, do you agree with that statement? Do you disagree with that statement? Their instruction is more structured on skills low on Bloom's taxonomy. This type of instruction denies students the opportunity to engage in what neuroscientists call productive struggle that actually grows our brain power. So that parallels with the work if you're familiar with Joe Bowler's work. Um, that productive struggle and how it's absolutely necessary. As a result, a disproportionate number of culturally and linguistically diverse students are dependent learners. They struggle because we don't off offer them sufficient opportunities in the classroom to develop the cognitive skills and habits of mind that would prepare them to take on more advanced tasks. Many children start school with small learning gaps but as they progress through school, the gaps between African-American and Latino and white students grows because we don't teach them how to be independent learners. It's not just a matter of grit or mindset. We have to help dependent students develop new cognitive skills and habits of mind that will actually increase brain power. All right, so two things that are necessary for thinking routines to take hold as a cognitive habit is there has, to be a, has, there has to be strong cues that prompt the thinker into starting a routine, and the routine has to be internalized, meaning the learner has to remember the steps in the routine on his own eventually. So this confirmed that these strategies need to be shared so that all students can develop their brain power. So how can we have add higher order thinking skills with little or no prep, right? So possessing the ability to design tasks with high cognitive level outcomes is an advanced teaching skill. And I'm excited to share a couple of strategies with you today. But first, let's just kind of synthesize what we just went over. So you can, you can think about um, the quotes that, um, that Hammond had there that I just read. And in the chat, or you can even do a thumbs up or a thumbs down or like a neutral, um, is building brain powers the missing link? Do you agree, disagree, or this is making you think? So you can add something to the chat or you can um, just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down, or I'm not sure yet. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of thumbs up. Looking at the chat. I see, agree, agree, agree. Awesome. All right. Some of you are drinking my Kool Aid. I like it. All right. Okay, so we're gonna dive into um, depth and complexity. So the overarching goal of depth and complexity is to move students toward expert knowledge of a content. 
So Beth Gould and Sandra Kaplan um, look to understand how an expert understands their field differently from a lace person. So this is how these pumps were developed. Through interviews, they saw that these experts knew things like repeating patterns, required rules, ethical dilemmas, changes over time, and essential vocabulary within their field. So they then developed these 11 prompts that we call depth and complexity. And the idea is that students can use these same ways of thinking to move closer to an expert level of understanding across all of our disciplines. And then through their work, they also identified habits that these experts shared and they developed the 10 scholarly attributes. And those are the, um, the 10 little icons that are listed below the depth and complexity. I've included some of the scholarly attributes resources at the end of the slide deck and I'll go over them when we get to the resource section. Okay, so we can absolutely grow students' ability to think. So what is depth and complexity? And we can start by comparing surface thinking to thinking with depth and complexity. So this perspective of this picture um, is the surface of an ocean. So I can see water, I can see a buoy, I see maybe a mountain, maybe that's Catalina in the back, there's clouds. And if we stay on the surface, there is stuff to learn about and it's beautiful and it definitely has its purpose. But if we go below the surface and we go deep, there really is much more to learn. So let's look at the depth the complexity prompts that go deep, and then we'll look at the prompts that go across, which are more complex. So depth refers to approaching or studying something from concrete to abstract, from the known to the unknown. So the eight prompts that do that are the big ideas, the details, the language of the discipline, patterns, unanswered questions, rules, ethics, and trends. So we give these prompts to students and we teach them how to use them first, but then we give them to them so that they can have a lens or a way to look at something more um, intentionally. So let's pretend our topic is ocean animals and your students um, pick an animal to study. So let's say they choose an orca, like in this picture, we have a couple orcas there. And in their report, you would probably get facts like their physical features, their habitat, their diet, maybe the predators, the anatomy, life cycle, all good stuff. But if we want students to go more deeply, anchor a meeting and really think about how the orca kind of imp is impacting the world around them, we could ask them um, different questions using the depth and complexity prompt. So for example, we might ask students, what are the details and, uh, and big ideas of life as an orca? So this question is asking students to go beyond the facts. If you were a scientist studying whales, what is the academic language you would need to know? So they probably would need to know, like maybe they're calling it a killer whale, we would want them to know an orca or aquatic or krill or plankton um, might be some of the academic language we would want them to be using within their work. What patterns do we see in orcas? Maybe their physical patterns or their migration patterns. What are the rules within orcas? Um, what, what are the rules if you see a whale or if, you, if you're scuba diving and you come you know, near one or you're in a boat and one comes up alongside of you, there are rules. Um, what are the ethical concerns of whales held in ca captivity? What trends are in whales in captivity over the, uh, over the past couple of, def of decades? So shifting students thinking to go a little bit deeper helps them think about orcas in a different way. And it helps them um, anchor that meeting so that they can really remember it um, and learn how to use this information in a different way. All right, so complexity moves horizontally. So now we look horizontally. So here we see Huntington Beach, Bora Bora and Antarctica. So now we are accessing complexity and seeing the impact or comparison of things. So the three prompts that look at the ocean horizontally include changes over time, multiple perspectives, and across di disciplines. So these prompts require you to examine topics by determining their relationships, connecting with other concepts, and building layer layers for understanding. So, um, when you go across, um, we help students think with complexity. So we might ask students, how has the treatment of orcas changed over time? Take, this per take the perspective of a SeaWorld trainer and talk about whales in captivity. How has the trend in the treatment of whales changed the treatment of other animals in captivity? 
And then kids start to start thinking this way um, across other disciplines and we're thinking about other topics when they get more familiar with this pattern of thinking. Okay, so I wanna give you an example and I've chosen Goldilocks and the Three Bears just because I needed a text that I, I think we're all familiar with. So I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, so typically when we read a story, we might start with um, the story elements um, and we might ask surface questions for students. Like we read a book, we want them to know the who, what, where, when, why, or maybe we uh, character setting, plot, conflict, resolution. Um, but if we want students to think more di more deeply and, and think about books in a different way, we can use the depth and complexity prompt. So let's practice that. All right, so thinking about Goldilocks and the Three Bears, um, what are some patterns? So patterns we're looking at reoccurring elements, predictive points, or cycles. So I'm thinking about the patterns that I've noticed in Goldilocks and the Three Bears is there was a pattern in that each time it was Papa Bear, then Mama Bear, and then Baby Bear. There's patterns in Goldilocks behavior, right? She tried everything biggest to smallest. Um, and when, when one thing would go wrong, it would lead to another thing going wrong. So those are some patterns that your students might notice. All right. Ethics. So ethics are controversies, dilemmas, biases, and decision making. So here's the participation part of the show. What are some ethical concerns in this story? So in the chat box, what are some ethical concerns that you would think about since you know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Yeah, breaking and entering, she trespassed. Why was a young girl off on her own? <laughs> yeah, eating other people's food, damaging property. Yeah, so students will notice this, right? They'll notice that um, she, you know, broke furniture. Now who's going to have to pay to fix that furniture? Or, um, you know, what about parents allowing, you know, a little girl alone in the forest? Um, what are some ethical concerns about that? Yeah, and stealing. Okay. Um, unanswered questions. So thinking about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So un unanswered questions, something unsolved, unknown. Um, what are some unanswered questions you have about this story? Where did she go? Where were her parents? Why was she in the woods alone? Why would she enter a stranger's home? Why were the bears living like humans? <laughs> what happened to them? How will this experience change them for all of them? Why wasn't she afraid of bears? Why did she break and enter? Did she learn her lesson? All great questions. I once had a student ask me, um, why would the porridge be different temperatures? Which I was like, that's, that's a great question. And why would they go, why would the bears go for a walk after making breakfast? Like, why did they leave their breakfast on the table and then leave? Which after reading that story like a hundred times, right? I'm like, why did I never think of that before? <laughs> um, and then why was she so tired that she fell asleep, you know, in someone else's bed? Um, and then whose laws do bears abide by? So when you start thinking about questions like this, it kind of changes how you're thinking about kind of a simple story um, to thinking more deeply about the story. Okay, and then rules. So rules are standards related to structure, order, organizational elements. So what rules were broken? Um, so social norms, right? Going into someone else's house, we don't eat other people's food. So those are some implied rules. There's rules of three. Um, three bears, three bulls, three chairs, three beds. 
And then rules of a fairy tale. So there's lots of versions of this story, but most of them start with once upon a time and then end with, and they lived happily ever after. I don't know if this one is that way though. Okay. And then multiple perspectives. So we could just think about this story um, is traditionally told from the point of view of a narrator, um, but how would the story change if this story was told through the, through the perspective of Goldie, Goldilocks or through you know, the little bear? So it can, change the, it can change the story. All right, so consider the difference in the thinking process. So when we're thinking about students using this lens and asking students to think about stories this way, it does change the thinking pattern and how students think about you know, what they're learning. And then because it's, it's interesting, right? It's different than just the who, what, when, where, where, when, why, or the story elements. It really does anchor meaning and it's more engaging for students. It helps them retain information um, and make connections. There are lots more prompts. So these are the top row is the content imperatives and the bottom row um, are the new depth and complexity prompts. You can also layer thinking. Um, you can layer thinking um, by comparing it to maybe another book. So in what ways do you think Goldilocks perspective parallels Little Red Riding Hood's perspective? So students as young as kindergarten can do this work. So they start looking at two texts and they can start um, looking at the different characters and they can say, how are they similar? How are, how are their experiences parallel? Um, and it's really fun to see um, and hear their, their responses. And then of course, um, all of this ties to our standards. So our standards are asking our students to do this high level of thinking. So when I use this slide with parents, when I'm, when I'm doing a gate presentation, I, I show them this slide and I show them how our old standards really had students um, use the lower level of blooms, right? The, our old standards, so back in like 2010, right? We were mostly asking students to apply, understand and remember. But with our new standards, we're really asking students to do that higher order thinking skills to analyze, evaluate, and create. So where we used to say we needed gate programs to give students opportunities to get in these higher order, order thinking skills because they need this, I'm saying now our students, all students need these skills and strategies for them to be able to access these higher order thinking skills. So the depth and complexity prompts and a lot of the other strategies that you'll learn in a gate program actually become scaffolds to help students use this higher order thinking. All right, and then there can be rigor through questioning. So lots of the, um, you can use the depth and complexity to add rigor just by changing the question that you ask students. So if I wanted to focus on patterns, I could ask students different questions that focus on patterns, but, but really um, change the, um, the, the kind of higher order thinking that students are doing. So how can we predict what will happen next based on what has happened so far? So that would be applying that information, right? What things does the pattern ask us to assume? So they're again, analyzing. Which of the recurring events do you see as negative, positive, or most likely to lead to change? So that's requiring students to use evaluation. And then why would someone wanna break the pattern? So that would be synthesizing. And then it gets kind of fun because you can take the, you can take the um, different prompts and you can, I call it prompt smashing, but I think um, the, the gate term is iconic intersection. But you could take two prompts and use them both to really um, increase the rigor of the question as well. So I won't read all of these, but they'll be here for you when you get these slides later. But how does an author's specific use of language contribute to the tone of the poem? Or what ethical issue contributed the most to this character's decision? So ability to synthesize. So it's kind of fun. And when students get um, better at this process, when they get into upper elementary, they're able to take um, the prompts and they're able to make their own questions and then share them um, with their peers to just kind of make it fun too. All right, so Dr. Gould and Dr. Kaplan developed this work under the Javis grant. So because it was under a grant, they, they're not able to um, publish any of this work. But last year, um, Ian Bird and Lisa Van Gammer, they wrote this book, The Gifted Gills Guide to Depth and Complexity. And it is all about the framework. So it has um, all of, explains depth and complexity in more detail, not in the 10 minutes that I just rushed through it. Um, so more in detail. And then it also talks about universal themes, um, think like a disciplinarian, 
um, and other um, gate strategies if you're if you're interested in um, in learning more about it in a book form. All right, so here's some tips for getting started. So each prompt um, needs to be needs to be taught. And I love how Megan this morning was talking about, you know, the need to, to really let kids um, kind of sit with stuff in their participation and not focusing on speed. Because I think sometimes we, um, we have a lot to cover. And so um, depth and complexity is really wanting students to sit with things a little bit longer. And instead of zooming through it, really taking the time to dive a little bit deeper. So again, I think we're getting away from you know, speed into more depth and complexity into the different concepts. And so as we do this across the grade levels, if students go deeper, starting in kindergarten, then they anchor in the meeting, then they, they keep those skills. So you know how as a, you know, if you're a second grade teacher, then kids go to third grade and you're like, I know your teacher taught you this last year. And they're like, I don't know, I don't think so. And you're like, no, I know they did, <laughs> right? Like they're, those skills just, they, they lose them. So these strategies help anchor um, the learning and just going deeper for a little bit longer um, will pay off. Um, in that retention and the ability for students to think this way. Um, be selective in the prompts you use. If you're just getting started, just use a, just start with a couple. So I love patterns, I love multiple perspectives, um, and I also love ethics, because I think that it, it really goes across every grade level. Um, so that might be a starting point for you. Connect prompts to previous knowledge and new, new knowledge. So make sure you're, you're modeling it a lot um, with your read allows, with your math lessons, showing them, you know, um, how patterns, like for example, um, can be used across the discipline. So when students, I know when I was a resource specialist, um, the transfer of skills and strategies was always kind of frustrating for me. I would teach students a skill or a strategy, maybe in writing, and then, um, you know, later we would be doing social studies and then I would be like, oh, we can use boxes and bullets. And they would be like, no, I only use that when I'm writing. I'd be like, no, no, you can, you can transfer that skill. We could use that across, you know, every discipline. And I think that when, when students see us using the same prompts across discipline, it helps them realize I can use these strategies across disciplines. So if, for example, you're working on patterns, um, you might use patterns in your read aloud, and then you might have you might show them some patterns, you know, when you're doing your math warm up, and then they might see some patterns in their science lesson later in the day. And then using that icon as a visual representation that kids start to say, oh, I, I see the pattern. I need to look through the lens of a pattern and then their brains start working in that way. Um, and then the more to integrate the prompts to the real world. So patterns, right? Patterns are everywhere, both, you know, in nature and, um, and just kind of in the world around us. So being able to see where they can see the patterns, unanswered questions are everywhere, um, ethics are everywhere. So it becomes really easy to start pulling those in um, and, and use those. So I wanted to show you just a few examples. And really a lot of this work is done in um, speaking and listening, <clears throat> excuse me. So we want students, um, you know, if you're doing a read aloud and kids are thinking through, we want them to be able to do that first. And then the next layer would be doing it, you know, in their writing. Um, and so um, a lot of this are some examples from our anchor charts that teachers have used. And then there are some student work. Um, this is a kindergarten example. So um, the one on um, the left is from a dual teacher. So that one's in Spanish. So, um, but basically there's the same thing. So it was a read aloud and then the students looked for um, different patterns and big ideas and details and multiple perspectives. This is a first grade example in a close listening um, for a, a read aloud book. Um, they were looking at a chicken egg and really looking at the function, parallel, the impact, um, and the process. And then here's a CGI um, anchor chart, which is kind of hard to see, but there's patterns on there. And then there's also language of discipline. All right, and then here's a second grade example. Um, so you can see another math example there where students were looking at parallels with addition and multiplication. Um, that middle example is um, an example of a grand conversation. So the teacher was using those shoes um, to have a grand conversation. And then this was a note-taking tool that the students used um, and brought with them um, during the grand conversation. And then, um, and then the last one is um, 
I'm forgetting the name of the book. Giraffes are dancing. No, giraffes can't dance. Um, that's a, a, a parallel between two characters. So the parallel and the paradox. Um, here's some more ideas. So there's this, a frame um, for Martin Luther King Day. And then here's another um, resource for, um, looks like the story of Ru Ruby Bridges. Um, this is a fifth grade example on the left. Um, I believe this is a page out of a student's reader's notebook. And then um, this middle one is just like an anchor chart. It looks like it's on the board of some students doing some work with big ideas and details around deforestation. And then, um, and then also um, students looking at um, some big ideas and details. So you can get really creative in how students work um, within these resources. I would encourage you to, to use some novelty. If you do the same thing over and over, um, it does kind of get worn out for students. So you wanna just kind of be selective in, um, in how you do that work. And then eventually they don't need the prompt anymore. They can do it. Um, or you can ask students, you know, with the post-it, I want you to look through the lens of, you know, um, unanswered questions today. So as you're reading, as you're reading this article, you know, um, what are some unanswered questions you want, you see, and you could, you could have them choose a lens, lens for that work. All right. So let's see, how am I doing on time? How am I doing on time, Carrie? You are doing great. You have until 9.53 before we have questions. We do have a few questions regarding depth and complexity. Do you want them now or do you want to wait till the end? Um, let's, let's wait till the end. Got it. And then, yeah, I just want to make sure I don't run out of time. Okay, so I will answer those questions. We'll just do it towards the end. Okay, so um, cultivating curiosity and divergent thinking. So um, I mentioned Rebecca Stobau, Stobau book. She has some great um, strategies to get students working within higher order thinking. Um, and so she also makes the case about the need for cognitive rigor. So research shows that students perceive cognitively more challenging tasks as meaningful and intriguing. Remember, understand, and apply often require convergent thinking with similar students' answers to assignments. However, the analyze, evaluate, and create levels typify the sort of divergent thinking that supports a variety of correct um, solutions or products. So I think this is really important, especially, you know, right now in this time when we all are concerned about, um, you know, students that have, you know, more that have unfinished learning. So it, we might be tempted to focus in on that un, unfinished learning and really look at the skills that they are missing. Um, but that might be a mistake because if we don't, if we just focus there and we don't take the time to, you know, work on these higher level um, tasks, then um, our students are going to continue to struggle and they're not going to get to these higher order thinking skills that we know that they need. Um, so in studies, preschool children ask 76 questions per hour to understand and gain information. However, in kindergarten, those are reduced to two to five questions in a similar time frame. Dismally, by fifth grade, students ask between zero and two questions per school day. And interestingly, an analysis shows top technology geniuses and invent, um, inventors possess one common feature, asking great questions. And I think this parallels with the work that um, Megan Frankie has done. So if you're familiar with um, some of her statistics on um, questioning and how, um, how students in math weren't using those skills, um, this is paralleling her work for sure. All right, so we can create a culture of curiosity by encouraging questions. So, um, okay, so I'm curious, how many of you um, thumbs up are using um, or have used Puzzlement? So Puzzlement could also be called Wonder and Notice, or it can be called like Picture of the Day. Is anybody already using this strategy? Couple, okay, couple, I see a couple thumbs up and then a lot of neutrals. Okay, so um, I know Kim Bass is presenting a little bit later on picture of the day. So if this is something that interests you, um, you could might want to go to her session. Um, but but puzzlement is a strategy to get kids asking questions. So some will call it notice and wonder. Um, basically, you share a compelling picture, or you can show a video, share a poem, um, or share a quote and ask students questions. So what do you, you know, what do you wonder about, you know, whatever you're showing them? So on the bottom right is a slide deck that you can access that has the steps of puzzlement. 
you could, you could just share it and that could be it. What do you wonder? And then you can move on, or you can use that to be, be a kickoff into a unit um, that you, that you move forward with. I want to show you just a couple of examples um, that can connect puzzlement with depth and complexity. Oh, in the upper, in the upper corner, um, there's a link puzzlement in blue. That one is a link, um, a teacher actually, Liz Hogerby um, in Loma Vista Intestine, she shared a, a slide deck that she created just last week. And so I asked her if I could share that with you guys so you can see what it would look like um, in a slide deck. Okay. And um, here we go. All right. So here's um, a fun example. Um, so a teacher used um, I noticed. So for this, and um, the students looked at each of these pictures. So just kind of a fun thing. And then here are some of their responses. So I noticed it looks like a disgusting pair of socks that are tan green and it looks like it folded. It looks smelly and dirty. And then I wonder, I wonder if the huge lizard is stuck in that disgusting, smelly and dirty socks and the lizard is healthy. Oops. And then um, this makes me think, this makes me think it's a smelly, disgusting, dirty T-Rex that is running away from a lizard that's trying to eat him. And the T-Rex is like, help me. And it looks like a sock T-Rex. So this is just an example. And this is a fun one of students um, of just, you know, describing what they notice and what they see. Um, and they're doing a lot of writing. And it's also fun to have students caption if you have something fun like this, you can have them caption um, the photos. All right, here's another, this is a more academic example. Um, this is a second grade example. Um, the teacher gave the students this um, picture in the upper left corner and asked them, what are you thinking? What questions do you have? And then you can see their anchor chart on the right. So these are the questions that the students generated by looking at the photo. And then um, you can see that um, that the teacher, it's Mrs. Johnson at Loma Vista in Tustin, she highlighted um, question one, four, and nine. And then she created a little platform um, for the students to do some research questions. So they were able to choose one of the questions. And then you can see in the lower two examples, um, they chose a question. And then she gave them some links um, some, or some resources that would help them do some research to answer those questions. So that's a way to kind of kick off a unit um, of study. Here's a six minute warning. Oh, here's another example um, that is, um, I think this was a third grade example. You can give students three different pictures and then have them what do they wonder. And then you can scaffold it a little bit too by giving them a word bank. So what patterns, how is this significant? What are the consequences, cause, types, reason? And then here's a third grade example of some questions that um, students developed. And then you could take this and then choose some questions and have students research that as well. Um, this is another example of um, some a picture, this, this teacher was doing kind of picture of the day. And then at the end of the week, she took two of the pictures and asked the students, I noticed that these two pictures both, and so it was looking at the big idea of both of the pictures, how do they parallel and what are the patterns? Um, and then you can see um, kind of a different level of responses to um, that the students came up with. And you'll notice that, that some students will go more literal and other students will start to go more deep um, in their understanding. Um, but just like in CGI, when you have students share your thinking and the students start to see what other students are thinking, it helps them develop that side of their brain. So it's really important to offer them this. And then um, you could do the same thing. You could start with, you know, uh, changes over time. So this is just rockets from, I think the one on the left is from like 1960 something. And then the one on the right is more current. Um, but how does this change over time? And then what questions do you have? Um, this is an example of a focus hole strategy where you share just a small part of a, of a picture and then you get bigger and bigger, but you stop on each slide and then you have the students, you know, what details do you notice? How has this changed your thinking now? And you just kind of grow that thinking. Um, that slide deck for um, this is also linked here when you get the slide deck. So cultivating curiosity and divergent thinking, um, we wanna make, make sure we create a safe environment. So Megan um, touched on that this morning. Um, we do want you know, kids to feel you know, brave and safe 
um, in these spaces. So definitely want to encourage questions and honor their thinking, um, using novelty to spark curiosity, modeling curiosity yourself, um, always telling, you know, showing kids like I was wondering about, you know, whatever, whatever might be a current event or a picture that you notice. Um, and things that you're curious about to make sure students have that opportunity. And then opportunity. So make sure, I know sometimes we, um, we, we save these divergent thinking tasks for you know, enrichment or when you, you finished your work, then you get to move on to this fun you know, divergent thinking task. And we wanna make sure that, that we're not doing that, that we're giving all students the opportunity to use, um, use their divergent thinking and develop their divergent thinking with these tasks. Okay. Here are my resources. May, um, Carrie, do we end at 10 or 10, 10? 10? Okay, I've got four minutes. That's minutes for questions. And I'm gonna put the resources in your, um, the link in your slide. Okay, yep. So I have on this slide deck a bunch of resources. So a weekly dose of curiosity and puzzlement is a free link. Um, it's by Ian Bird and he'll send you every Friday um, a bunch of videos that are really fun and cool that um, you want to preview them first to make sure they're age appropriate for your kids. Um, and some of them, like one of them was um, like the world in four hours, like it was going around the world. So you wouldn't want to show them that for us. But anyway, um, but lots of cool resources if you're just looking for something to just kind of intrigue your students, um, that's free. Um, here are the resources for um, the Gifted Guild. Um, Lisa Van Gammer um, gave us a uh, um, discount code for these um, question stems. It's normally $5, but um, there's $3.50 with this um, code. And then um, Jay Taylor has a bunch of resources that are like the depth and complexity. You can get some cool magnets um, and lots of different you know, posters and different resources. Um, and he gave us a 10% off code if you're interested in getting any of their resources. And then um, this Google Chrome extension is awesome. It's a way to um, pull the, the prompts just easily onto a slide. Um, or you could also use emojis. So I just gave you some examples and the kids really, I mean, they love the emojis. Don't we all love the emojis? Um, but you could just use emojis um, if you wanted to and you could even work with your kids and agree on whatever emoji you wanted to for you know, the different prompts. Um, depth and complexity magnets. In my district, I make magnets for all of our teachers that participate in our certification. Um, so we use these Avery magnet sheets, um, and then I included the templates for the magnets for both scholarly attributes and depth and complexity. Um, if you are a K-1 teacher, um, not just Child's Play, this is a, um, a, re a website that was referenced in um, that, that book, Depth and Complexity, um, and it's really, really good for um, if you're a K-1 teacher. Birdseed is another great resource. Uh, lots, of, um, lots of Depth and Complexity resources. Um, he also has Birdseed TV. Um, that is, um, this is a paid subscription, but these are, are pre-built lessons that have videos um, that are great. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. And then um, Megan Venezia is, is um, one of my colleagues here and she posts um, most of her work on Twitter. So if you're not following her on Twitter, I would recommend you follow her because she gives away all of her stuff. Um, but she's created some really cool slide decks for language of the discipline. And then Krista Johnson, um, she brought them on Seesaw and has them posted on Seesaw. So if you're interested in that, you can grab those there. Here are some scholarly attribute slides. And then um, here's another one that you can use um, for students to get to know um, the prompts by looking at within themselves. So that's that one. All right, I have a couple minutes to answer questions. So Carrie, what questions do we have? Okay, Layla asked, what is the role or benefit for prompting imaginary or fantastical thinking to tap higher level thinking? And she's basing that off of Vivian, uh, I hope I'm saying the name right, Vivian, Vivian Gussie's uh, kindergarten work. Okay. Wow. That's making me think. Okay, can you ask me the question again? Can we start with an easier one? What? Yeah, I can. The easier <laughs> one is how do you introduce depth and complexity to your to your students? Yeah, I would I would start. You have to teach them first what it is and use it like a lot in a read aloud. You, like patterns, you would show them. Look at here's patterns in nature. Here's patterns in a book. Really, really obvious. So go more concrete. You know to to you know um, more abstract. For sure. And then it depends on the age of the kids, but even if you have older kids, if they haven't experienced it before, you have to go pretty, 
pretty concrete just for them to understand. And then once you're, once you know, and you, you'll figure it out by when you start making the questions a little bit more rigorous, when they can start doing that work, then you know when they have it and when they don't. Like for Goldilocks, right? You could say if the Goldilocks and, um, or if Goldilocks went in the backyard following the patterns of the story, what might she see? And if a kid's like, I don't know, then, or if another kid goes, oh, maybe if she sits on the swing, one would be too low, one would be too high, and one would be just right. Or, you know, so then you can say like, oh, they get the pattern. They get the pattern inside of a story. Now they can go on to more complex thinking. I hope I answered that question. I'm not sure I did. <laughs> and then again to Layla's, uh, Layla, so what she's asking, and Layla, you can unmute, I believe, but what is the role or benefit for prompting imaginary thinking to tap high level thinking? So. Yes, yeah, so, you know, Vivian Gusson Paley, who, who was a kindergarten teacher, known and published, um, I think she lived, lived in Chicago, talks about, um, well, actually explains how she gets in the world of um, the children to help teach. And it just seemed to be connected to what Megan was saying today. Being culturally responsive means um, having a way to get past our sort of knee-jerk reaction to children's um, thinking that's so influenced by the movies and things, you know, we, we, I think we have to get past that, right? Past our <laughs> aversion to them seeming to be stuck in the imaginary world that's um, pre, you know, prefab, but, but it does stimulate their thinking. Yeah. Um, and how can we sort of harness children's natural um, tendency to, you know, to use fantastical thinking in, um, in these sort of higher level, you know, what you described as the depth and complexity um, prompts. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So I, I see what you're saying now. Um, so yeah, oh, yeah. So I think you go from something, I'm just using Goldilocks because it's a book that I think all of you would know, but you could use a, a different book that's probably like, you could even use like, like something for science or social studies, right? that is, is um, more concrete and not as fantastical, right? Um, to, to show them the patterns and to, to bring it in that way. Um, I was just using that example just because I wanted like a shared text that I knew we all knew, but for sure you could, you know. You, no, I'm, I'm, saying the op I'm saying the opposite, Karen. I'm <laughs> saying how, how to honor, value, see, and hear um, children's fantastical thinking. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that's that divergent thinking that is honoring when they have like the crazy idea. And instead of being like, that was weird, asking them, tell me more. Like, what do you mean by that? Because when you ask that additional question, then you realize like, oh, they just saw something I never would have imagined that is in that realm of that kind of divergent, cool thinking. And then the more that a teacher says to that student, that was, yeah, tell me more Then other kids are, are more apt to, to, to also, you know, go through um, that line of thinking and provide some, you know, divergent ideas as well. So yes, I still don't think I answered your question. <laughs> Are there any other questions, Carrie? I there were no other questions, Karen. No? All right. Well, um, my information is on the slide deck. So thank you all so much for coming. And, um, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your morning. Thank you, Karen, so much.